Good afternoon, Urban Leaguers, sisters and brothers of the movement. It's so good to see and, and, and be with all of you uh, this afternoon. Uh, I am Don Cravens, Jr., Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of the National Urban League. And, and, and as always, pleasure to join you. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedules to be with us. Um, if you're expecting to see President Morial today, he has been called into a meeting at the White House with the president. They're going to be discussing, I think, some very important issues, obviously some very important issues that we're all facing. And so he was not able to join. When you become the number two at an organization, though, you get the blessing, I'll call it a blessing, that you get to stand in on, on wonderful events such as this one today. And so I'm very, very happy to join you and to work with our wonderful team um, in putting this together and hope that you will be able to get some great benefits from this. First of all, I want to um, just talk a little bit about this issue. This is an important issue, but an often overlooked issue, the aspect of police accountability, state law enforcement officers, bill of rights laws. As we know, the events of 2020, including the deaths of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and countless others provided a catalyst um, and renewed the focus on police reform across the nation. A recent poll by Data for Progress found that 62%, 62% of likely voters believe we should pass reforms that increase accountability and reduce racial inequity in policing practices, and that we need to protect Americans. We need to protect Americans. So think about that. We need to protect Americans and communities of color from police brutality and violence. At this critical point in history, sisters and brothers, it is important that the National Urban League and that, that the National Urban League, the Urban League movement, which consists of our, our wonderful 91 affiliates, as well as our volunteer organizations, our young professionals and our guilders, it is important that we are prepared and informed on this major issue uh, in the police reform area. And so that's what we are here today to talk about. In April, we released our 21 pillars for redefining public safety and restoring community trust. The 21 pillars provide a plan to address the current state of policing and public policy safety going forward. Also in April, the state of Maryland, my home state now, repealed its police bill of rights law. The law had been instrumental in preventing police accountability and severely limiting civilian oversight in the state of Maryland. Some credited the law with reinstating the police officers um, involved in the 2015 death of Freddie Gray. The Maryland legislature's actions show that while federal action is very important, and you hear about federal action out of our Washington Bureau all the time, it's important that we continue to realize though that states do not have to wait for the federal government to take action on police reform. Maryland is here with us today. And I'm so honored to be able to uh, introduce and tell you that the speaker of the Maryland House of Delegates, Speaker Adrian Jones, will be joining us today and can talk about those efforts. As a former state representative, as a former state senator, I can only, God bless her, because I know that the work she had to put in and her, her colleagues had to put in um, to undertake such major reform. So congratulations to them. I encourage everyone to check to see whether your own state has a police bill of rights law and learn about it, research it, do your research. The transformational changes we seek in public safety require state and local efforts and an on ground engagement. Now, before I th turn things over to Jerrica Richardson, our outstanding senior vice president of equitable justice and strategic initiatives division, I would like to give my sincerest thanks to our guest speakers. Again, to our speaker, Adrian Jones of the Maryland House of Delegates, as well as to attorney Jeremy Burnett, a partner at the Ackerman LLP, at the law firm, and to the entire justice team, the equitable justice team, for their hard work in putting this presentation together. So as always, I, I believe that this is gonna be another one of those events where hopefully you're gonna gain some real knowledge and it is what Mark and I and the entire Urban League, National Urban League team, we want to be able to provide you with resources. We want to be able to provide you with, the, with tools necessary so that you can continue living the Urban League mission, making a change, 
fighting for equity in your community. And so I'm so proud to be part of this event today. And I, again, I wanna thank all of our guest speakers, Jerrica and her entire team. And so at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Jerrica. Thank you, God bless you and have a wonderful day. Thank you so much, Don. And um, really just thank you for all of your leadership in our movement. Um, and to my colleagues, as Don said, we are at a critical moment in history. Earlier this summer, Derek Chauvin was sentenced to 22 and a half years in prison for murdering George Floyd over one year ago. Though the sentence, um, though his convictions and sentence holds Chauvin accountable for what he did and what we all witnessed on that video tape, it does not hold accountable the system that produced Derek Chauvin and others like him. Only witnessing that video, um, without witnessing that video, we wouldn't be where we are today. Um, but only structural change on a national level can change this system and do that. That is a legacy we must build. Our 21 Pillars puts forth a plan to transform policing and move us closer to a world of a more equitable and just space, one where public safety actually is defined by the public. As Don said, we are here today to discuss a critical and often overlooked reform uh, that's listed in our plan, uh, and it pertains to law enforcement officers' Bill of Rights laws. I am joined by the other members of the Equitable Justice and Strategic Initiatives team, Alex Rias, our Senior Director for Equitable Justice, um, Yvette Bada Namaku, our Senior Director of Judiciary, Civil Rights, and Social Justice, and Nani Anyakweli, our Director of Criminal Justice. You'll be hearing from each of them during this pre presentation. Uh, but before we move on and go into more detail on the Police Bill of Rights, uh, Yvette will provide you with an update on where we are in the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Yvette? Thank you. The George Floyd Justice and Policing Act is still the main police reform vehicle moving through Congress right now. The bill passed the House on March 3rd of this year with a party line vote of 220 to 212. And now in the Senate, Democrats led by Senator Booker and Congresswoman Bass have been in negotiations with Republicans led by Senator Tim Scott to ensure that they are able to introduce a Senate bill that has a chance of passing and becoming law. These no negotiations are still ongoing and Senator Scott's deadline to have an agreed upon draft by the end of June has passed. However, throughout this process, we have been in close communication with these members, highlighting our priorities found in our 21 pillars. And these priorities include municipal and individual liability for police misconduct. Um, and that includes criminal liability for law enforcement officers who engage in excessive force, police misconduct and obstruction, which is found in our pillar five, banning chokeholds and no-knock warrants found in pillar 10, ending the militarization of law enforcement found in pillar 12, and transparency reporting and data collection including a police misconduct registry, national police accreditation system, and decertification index found in pillars 14, 18, and 19. I'll now turn it over to Alex for an update on our 21 pillars toolkit. Hello everyone. Uh, again, my name is Alex Rice. Uh, as you all know, we released our 21 pillars for redefining public safety uh, back in April of this year. And we're proud to announce now that our 21 Pillars Activation Toolkit went live today. It's available on our website uh, for you all to uh, not only take a look at, uh, but to implement. The toolkit is an advocacy and activation tool for our 91 affiliates around the country and for all of those who are part of the Urban League movement. Uh, it provides guidance for responding to issues of police violence and distrust in the communities. The toolkit includes examples of local and state reforms uh, relating to many of our pillars and the applicable policy and legislative uh, activity on the particular issue. We go really into depth here uh, on this toolkit as we did with the 21 pillars generally. Uh, the accompanying toolkit uh, is intended to serve as a policy menu where you identify 
uh, what may work best in your community. Each reform included is not ideal for every community. And, and that's why we included such a diversity uh, of issues and solutions. Um, some communities have already addressed some of the reforms that are listed and some haven't. Uh, community discussion and activation is critical here. Uh, and we encourage you each to review the 21 pillars, uh, the 21 pillars toolkit, and to prioritize what best serves your state, your community, and devise a plan uh, according to the local action that's necessary. With that, I will turn it over to my colleague and friend, Nadi. Thank you, Alex. Hi, everyone. I'm now going to kick off the discussion on the Law Enforcement Bill of Rights laws. Law Enforcement Bill of Rights laws, also known as Police Bill of Rights laws, represent a form of special legislation for police officers. The laws govern the internal discipline process for officers within their department and grant officers special rights the average person does not receive. 19 states currently have these laws, and I'll show you a map of these states later on in the presentation. These laws differ, but they contain some of the same provisions. Under some police bill of rights laws, during an investigation into misconduct, an officer may get a cooling off period before he has to respond to questions. The officer under investigation must be told the names of his complainants and the testimony against him before he is ever interrogated. The officer under investigation is to be interrogated at a reasonable hour with a union member present. If the officer enters into a formal hearing process, he is given the right to choose one of the three members of the hearing board or two of the five members of the hearing board, depending on the state. These are just some of the provisions for the states with police bill of rights laws. Some argue that the process purpose of these laws is to ensure swift investigations and to protect officers from abusive practices. What communities have found is that it stands in the way of thorough investigations of police misconduct and prevents police accountability. The main supporters of these laws are police unions and their lobbyists. Many of them have pushed for the passage of these laws. Lastly, it's important to note that while we have these state laws, these kinds of provisions can also be found in collective bargaining agreements and police contracts. Next slide. Interest in police bill of rights laws is, is new. It spiked right after the murder of George Floyd, as you see that spike towards the end. And then it spiked even further in April following Maryland's repeal of their police bill of rights law. Since then, interest has tapered, but for better or worse, it is only a matter of time before people develop interest again. Next slide. The following states have police bill of rights laws. As you can see, about one third of the states in our nation have these laws. I will now turn things over to Jeremy Burnett of the law firm Ackerman for some background on the history of these laws. Thank you, Nani, I appreciate that. And I appreciate the opportunity to be with you all today. Uh, so I would like to start with my first slide on the history of the Bill of Rights statutes. Uh, these statutes are often passed under the cover or, or the guise of trying to protect officers from arbitrary or capricious treatment. What is meant in this scenario is uh, there are police chiefs historically in this country who have fired uh, officers and deputies because they didn't vote for them or they didn't support their candidate for a certain office. That is arbitrary and capricious and should be protected. Uh, no one should be fired for that. However, these statutes, as Noni has alluded to, go much further than that and create many problems. They're often passed, they're always passed with heavy support from labor. And uh, we see in these uh, legislative histories what I would call a uh, unholy alliance, because you see some conservative, conservative uh, politicians partnering with labor, which you don't usually see those for folks working together. Uh, again, these statutes provide many protections to police officers that civilians do not have. If a civilian is suspected in a murder, for example, they will be interrogated late at night by multiple interrogators using abusive language, uh, using tactics such as uh, threats or promises of leniency for a confession, and uh, police officers are allowed to lie to civilian suspects and say we have evidence that you did this and to specify that evidence that does not exist. However, these statutes uh, prohibit police from using these same tactics against their own when they're investigated for misconduct. So they want to be able to have a double standard in which they can subject civilian suspects to the same tactics they want to be protected from. Uh, historically, these uh, statutes have been very popular 
But as has already been referenced, since the murder of George Floyd, there is more interest in these statutes and their revision and their repeal. So uh, the next slide, I want to talk about Nevada's uh, excuse me, statute. There are a few states I want to highlight because of some developments or, or uh, some other reasons. So Nevada's uh, rights of police officers statute was originally passed in 1983. Uh, it was revised in 2019 to add several problematic provisions. And those are listed here. Uh, essentially, uh, an officer who's being investigated is given all the evidence or allowed to view all the evidence against the officer before giving a statement or being interrogated. No civilian suspect is given that lecture. Uh, there, there was a one-year statute of limitations imposed on, on officer discipline under the revision to the statute. Uh, they cannot reopen an investigation of an officer without new evidence, and they cannot re reassign an officer pending an investigation. Now, this was a case where these, the sponsor, the state senator who sponsored the legislation, had two representatives from the police union read the statute into the record, into the, in the Senate committee hearing. In other words, that they're not the least bit shy about showing uh, the fraternal order of police and their support of these statutes. In doing so, they characterized the statute as a labor issue, an internal personnel issue. Uh, but as we know, it goes much further than that. So that passed in 2019. However, in 2020, one year later, the very same sponsor of that statute with the oppressive provisions I introduced Senate Bill 2, which repealed several of them. And she admitted in the interview she was doing so because of increased scrutiny of these statutes since the murder of George Floyd. Uh, what we see in this debate is uh, on one side, folks who are progressives and want repeal or revision say this is an affront to, to, to Black, Brown people, all communities who are subject to abusive policing. However, the, the other side will say it is a, uh, a uh, personnel issue. In fact, this bill sponsor, even while revising it, said that her intention was that all workers should be treated fairly in the workplace. This is much more than workplace protections. Uh, this is protecting misconduct. So they had a, a very spirited public debate about SB2, which revised the Nevada statute. Uh, basically, everybody opposed statute or SB2 for different reasons. One camp, we had progressive groups such as uh, uh, the ACLU, Me Familia Vota, and Forced Trajectory Project, others in Nevada that advocated the SB2 not pass because it did not repeal all of the bad provisions in the Law Enforcement Bill of Rights. And we had other folks from a trio of police unions who wanted the statute left untouched. Ultimately in Nevada, they did pass SB2 and removed several of the problematic provisions despite no support from the Republican Party. All 13 Republicans voted against in the, in the assembly. Four Democrats also voted against because the bill did not repeal all of the problematic provisions. And the news media characterized it as a modest revision and the police union said it was, quote, disgusting. So uh, that had some activity. They passed some negative provisions that were immediately repealed, several of them in the wake of, of George Floyd's murder. Uh, this is an example of a modest revision that was instituted because of political pressure. So we, we take our victories where we find them. And there was some victory here. So uh, I wanted to share that example. And the next example is Wisconsin. Next slide, please. Yes, Wisconsin was their statute, their Law Enforcement Bill of Rights statute was passed in 1980. Uh, it was specifically passed because there was in fact a police chief in, in Milwaukee, Harold Breyer, who did uh, make personnel decisions arbitrarily and capriciously. He's, the one example cited often, but he was actually in Wisconsin, who fired his officers if they didn't support or give to his campaign, et cetera. Uh, however, uh, in this past with, in a bipartisan manner, pretty overwhelmingly, one legislator pointed out that it was, quote, a hard bill to vote against. He went so far as to say he was not one to go on record as being a, a, a state senator who voted against the police officer's Bill of Rights statute. And then when asked further about the oppressive provisions, he didn't even realize they were there. He just was voting basically in name only. So these are uh, difficult votes because of, uh, for some folks because of the way they are presented and the way they're characterized. The uh, Wisconsin statute has received some recent debate about revision because it has a revision that requires the officers to get paid while they're being investigated uh, and uh, all the way to the end of their appeals. Now this has cost the city of Milwaukee $2.1 million 
over a course of 10 years. His 32 officers who were terminated appealed their terminations. All of the 32 in this case, all of those terminations were uh, sustained. In other words, they were terminated. It was the right decision. But they received salary and benefits until their appeals were exhausted, costing the city, as I said, more than $2 million. So I, I share this example because it shows how this a statute that was once very popular has come under scrutiny. And it also presents an opportunity that when we can make an argument that a statute is also costing public money, as in this case, that, that may be another selling point for reform for some folks. So that is Wisconsin that I wanted to share with everyone as, a, as an example. One more example, and that is Illinois. This one is, uh, shows us that revision may be easier than repeal. Uh, advocates have been pushing for revision of the statute because it protects officers who have, uh, it gives officers more protection than uh, civilians. And this is a case where, uh, like Noni talked about, uh, the 48 hour waiting period. If an officer is investigated in Illinois for misconduct, shooting someone, et cetera, uh, they are told they're having, they're scheduling an interrogation and then the officer is given 48 hours to have the interrogation. No civilian gets that right. And of course, critics say that gives them an opportunity, the officers an opportunity to uh, manufacture stories or get their stories straight. Uh, and here's what the police union says. They say that these cooling off periods of two days in this case are necessary because quote, a couple of nights sleep helps restore an officer's memory especially after the trauma of a fatal shooting. Now keep in mind, the civilian suspect is given no sex luxury of, of two day cooling off period. So um, there was a revision in 2020 that did address that particular provision, but it did require that no longer is the officer given all the information of everybody that made a complaint out of you know, fear of retaliation. And also they're not given information about the interrogators. Uh, and then there was also a requirement in the statute that a complaint against an officer had to be supported by a sworn affidavit. Now I share this with you in particular because it is an, it is an example of a provision that seems innocuous, right? I mean, you, you wouldn't think that you'd want somebody uh, accusing a police officer of misconduct unless they would, would swear to it or, or that, you know, that they're not lying. Um, however, when you think about folks making these complaints who are not acquainted or familiar or comfortable with the legal process, and there's a document that says under penalty of perjury, I swear, uh, they may be reluctant to follow that document, especially if they believe, if I'm not believed, they're going to come after me for perjury, even if I'm telling the truth. So that, that provision was removed. And in fact, those two provisions, as it says, came out of the statute without any opposition and became effective one week ago. So that is Illinois. So again, I share those as examples of, you know, we want repeal and not everybody may be successful with Maryland this. We may have to do some of this piecemeal as a community. So the next slide talks about some specific efforts to repeal. Now our, our special guest, uh, Speaker Jones, will talk about Maryland. I'll just point out a couple of things. It's the first state to repeal the Law Enforcement Officer Bill of Rights. Its statute was considered broader than some others. And it didn't happen overnight, as, as we know. It, it took a, a great amount of time and an effort. Um, and Democrats in the state legislature ultimately had to override the governor's veto, but they were successful. So that is a model for us all to aspire to. There are two other states where there is a good uh, effort underway, it seems like, for repeal. And that is in Rhode Island. And the momentum there is because the statute has been shielding officers engaged in misconduct. Okay, this law in, in Rhode Island uh, has been used a few times to shield misconduct, like I said. In 1993, an officer killed three teenagers. He had pulled them over, hit one of them in the face with a, with a flashlight. And then he subsequently murdered them when they, when they complained because they'd ruined his career. Now, when the police chief gave a comment to the media about the investigation, there was a provision in the Rhode Island statute that said that uh, the officer, that no comments can be made to the media about a, a police investigation. So the internal investigation against this convicted murderer was basically, or was stopped because of, of a, a comment to the media that there was an investigation. Fortunately, the state Supreme Court overturned that, said the hearing committee went too far. But they, the committee, the hearing committee was able to overrule a decision in which an officer in Rhode Island was fired for seeing his lady friend while on duty. And uh, he was fired and the hearing committee changed that to a suspension for 30 days, even though there's videotaped evidence against the officer. 
And more recently in this year, the Rhode Island Bill of Rights was cited as a reason the department could not fire an officer who was convicted of assault for kicking and kneeling on a handcuffed man as he lay on the ground in April 2020. The reason given was that the officer had appealed the conviction and the statute prohibited disciplinary action as long as the court case was ongoing. And as we know, these appeals often don't work out for them, but they continue to be protected during the appeal. And lastly, I'll, I want to talk about Delaware's uh, efforts to repeal. Uh, Delaware has a very specific and particularly strong uh, provision that records compiled during an investigation or grievance procedure uh, must remain confidential and cannot be released, released to the public. And this includes personnel files, uh, investigatory files. Uh, what it does is it prevents the public from knowing when there's a pattern or practice of misconduct in the, in the police department by keeping this information secret. And so the uh, NAACP and ACLU are fighting for reform and repeal. And uh, whereas the, uh, whereas the uh, police union says that they need these provisions to protect officers from uh, unfounded investigations. So we've continued to have tension between reformists and police unions who are, give probably unsatisfactory explanations for these provisions. And I know that Nani now wants to talk more about these provisions. Thank you, Derby. I'll now turn it over to the next slide, which is focused on um, new sweeps on police bill of rights law. There was one incident in Louisiana where, um, similar to many of the stories Jeremy just told, an officer uh, engaged in excessive, excessive force and was reinstated because there were technical issues during his investigation that were in violation of these police bill of rights laws. Um, this slide contains more detail on it, but I'm gonna move on to another part of the new sweeps um, as Jeremy has recounted many instances in which these laws have prevented accountability from occurring. In Maryland, Baltimore former mayor, Stephanie Rawlings Blake blamed the Maryland's law enforcement bill of rights law for frustrating the investigation into the death of Freddie Gray while in police custody. Maryland's law provided that after an incident, superiors cannot question an officer without the presence of a lawyer of the officer's choosing, and that officer has 10 days to line up with such representation. In addition to Mayor Rawlings Blake, other officials have also spoken against provisions in, provisions in their state's bill of rights law. The Tampa police chief has written that the legislation is bad law that helps bad cops. And the chief assistant state attorney, Deb Barra, of Orlando has commented that the officer's bill of rights in their state needs to be revised. She has stated that the officers have so many rights that it's, it becomes very difficult for the agency to get rid of those bad apples and the statute is harmful. Next slide. We have identified around seven major problematic provisions in these statutes. I'd like to highlight these seven. First, there are time limits on disciplining officers. These, these provisions essentially create statute of limitations regarding how quickly an investigation must begin and end and how long an agency has to admit, administer the discipline. There are provisions that have already been discussed that restrict interrogation procedures. There are provisions that limit discipline and there are provisions that erase misconduct records. There are also provisions that give officers unfair access to information offer a possible waiting period before an officer can be interrogated and limit the capacity of civilian oversight. I'll dive, a, I'll dive a little deeper into some of these provisions in the next slides. Officers have unfair access to information. Some provisions give officers access to information that civilians would not normally receive in, in any kind of investigation, nor would most of us receive in our jobs if we were being questioned about something. These include access to all evidence, identification of all witnesses or, or the complainant, and following their interrog interrogation, officers will quickly have the right to the recorded interrogation. For example, in Florida, officers review are allowed to review all of the existing evidence before beginning the investigative process. The right to confront witnesses against oneself is crucial to a fair trial, but the law enforcement pool of rights do not adequately address or deal with all the other issues that come with this and it simply ends up um, becoming an obstacle in police accountability. Next slide. There are also provisions that limit oversight. Several states have laws that limit oversight. They include provisions like Kentucky and Minnesota, which are listed on the screen. 
Kentucky states that no officer as a condition of continued employment by the employing agency shall be compelled to speak or testify or be questioned by any person or body of a non-governmental nature. This essentially means that an officer in Kentucky never has to directly respond to community members who are not a part of the government. Minnesota has a somewhat provision. As some of you may know, this directly conflicts with, some, with one of our 21 pillars, which is to create civilian review boards with final authority. Civilian oversight boards are not a catch-all solution to excessive police force, but they can help to hold police accountable and reduce instances of unnecessary use of force. Effective oversight boards also have the promise of enhancing public safety and renewing public trust in police, especially in over police communities. Next slide. We've discussed this waiting period before officers are interrogated. These delays can, have, can come up in different ways. In some states, like the repealed Maryland statute and the Kentucky statute, officers are simply given a period of time. In other states, the delay is allowed so officers can get an attorney or a representative from the union. There's a widespread impression that delays in investigations allow officers time to collude or create a consistent exculpatory story. These delay provisions apply not only to officers suspected of misconduct, but also to officers who may have been mere witnesses. Advocates of waiting periods argue that traumatic incidents adversely affect memory and you need two full nights of sleep to have an accurate memory. On the other side, folks argue that there is no consistent evidence that stress adversely affects memory and studies actually show that your memory is best immediately following an incident. Um, now over to Jerrica, but before I send it to Jerrica, I'm going to drop the link for the toolkit she mentioned previously in the chat. Thanks, Nani. So we've heard about the history of police bill of rights laws and better understand the problematic provisions. As mentioned earlier, the Maryland legislature was successful in repealing its police bill of rights law and Speaker Jones is here to give us more insight into that process. But before we dive into the conversation, here is a little, here's some more information on her background. Uh, Speaker Adrian A. Jones shattered two glass ceilings when she was unanimously elected by the full House of Delegates to serve as its first African-American and first woman speaker in the House's history. Prior to being elected speaker, she held the distinction of being the first African-American woman to serve as speaker pro tem in the Maryland House of Delegates, serving in that capacity under Speaker Mike Bush for 16 years. During her tenure, she served on the House Appropriations Committee and was chair of the Capital Budget and Education and Economic Development Subcommittees. She has been a delegate since 1997. Speaker Jones was born in Cowdensville, Maryland, a historic African-American community located, located near Arbutus in Southwest Baltimore County. She attended Baltimore County Public Schools, graduating from Lansdowne High School and is a proud alumna of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, where she received her Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology. She attended the National Security Seminar, U.S. Army War College in 2007. In 2008, she received an honorary Doctor of Law degree from Doucher College in Towson, Maryland. She is the mother of two adult sons and proud grandmother of two wonderful grandchildren, Jalen and Janelle Jones. Welcome Speaker Jones and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me and it's good information I heard thus far from the very, what's happening in the country. Um, well, we are looking, well, I'm glad that you found the uh, information to be um, helpful and informative to our community of leaders here at the National Urban League. But I think we want to pull the curtains back a little bit and really talk to you and get a better sense of strategically how we can accomplish this. So um, in your opinion, did the law prevent police accountability in Maryland? And if so, how? If you could kind of explain from your standpoint, it's impacted. Um, in terms of how it got started and everything like that? Or? Well, the impact of the original uh, law oh, okay. enforcement, the oh, yeah, yeah, rights yeah. law. Okay. All right. Okay. 
Um, Maryland's um, law enforcement officer, Bella Rice, um, here with, I'm going to just say LEODR, um, was enact, enacted into law by the Maryland General Assembly back in 1974, nearly 50 years ago. And we were the first state in the nation to do so. And at that time, the thought was that the LEOBR will protect officers from intrusive and unnecessary investigations and harassment within the department. Officers claimed that they could not do their jobs effectively under certain conditions. Over the years, however, the use of LEOBR morphed into a powerful and effective mechanism for police officers to avoid consequences as a result of their misconduct. And if you were to look um, where we are today, both in Maryland and nationally, we have mounting cases of police misusing and abusing their power, many times resulting in um, deadly outcomes. And as a result of that, um, the uh, Maryland uh, in Maryland, and as a result of the nationwide protests and following the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and others, um, in my role as speaker, I knew we had to respond in a meaningful way. Um, the timing was right. The entire country was going through a reckoning, and we had the public support, political will, and couldn't miss such an, an opportunity. And as a result of that, I um, established a, a work group to look into, um, actually a work group called uh, Police Reform and Accountability, in which I had the chair of that, that work group was the vice chair of our Judiciary Committee, African American Female. And over the um, years, we, I, I charged them to make recommendations um, to make some greater transparency and change to policing across Maryland. Um, and after discussion and debate and hearing testimony from over 100 um, citizens, uh, 1,000 people who, who hours of meeting with law enforcement officers and advocates in particular mo mothers who have lost their son to police violence. Um, we had strong recommendations in which we based a bill on. Um, and that it, we, and we also were able to repeal that bill we passed back in the, the General Assembly back in 1974 in Maryland. So and we were the first to enact it and we were the first to repeal it. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's clear that the death of George Floyd has just been a catalyst for this movement around the country um, and that it really, I think, created and, and laid the ground for there to be political will in Maryland. Uh, but I think some of our colleagues on this call uh, may be in other jurisdictions where there may be political will uh, among the overarching community, uh, but that there is still an uphill battle as far as um, finding support for police reform measures from some of their colleagues in, in, in their legislatures. Can you talk a little bit about uh, your experience and who were maybe some of the opponents, not necessarily naming them by name, but kind of what um, their arguments were for uh, or against their arguments for what their arguments were against appeal or repeal. And also if there were any surprising um, uh, supporters that you may not have assumed would have supported this work. Um, and I think just kind of hearing from you uh, about the lay of the land and maybe some of the hurdles that you overcame and within the body of the legislator, legislature and getting this passed would be really right. helpful to some of our colleagues. Okay, uh, I think I need to clarify, Maryland, we are a majority Democratic uh, state, both in the House and the Senate. So that helped. But also I think with that work group, um, we had the opponents who 
would have their say, but we, um, and some of them um, were from like the, the sheriffs and the other smaller uh, groups. And they just saw that they're just taking away their, their rights. Some of them were the um, uh, FOP, um, but surprisingly, also, we had, um, in addition to the various civil rights groups, et cetera, and support, we did have some um, other law enforcement officers because when they would want to go against it, and and, um, and they were thinking that we're we're doing a wide brush on all officers, and I point out to them, we're going after the bad actors. Um, and I said, the majority of the officers, you know, they would not, this one would not fall under them. But unfortunately, the, the numbers were growing and these things were happening and we just couldn't sit and, and, and wait. Um, we had a lot of discussion on the floor regarding this, but I think that uh, in, in the end, um, it did come out um, that the bill did have that support, although the governor did veto it and we were able to override it. I think that was really helpful context to hear where you had uh, members in of law enforcement community where there were some that after you really explained what the focus and the purpose of this was uh, that were able to support it. Um, was there any point during this process where you thought repeal might not happen? No, for some reason that my gut was, to, I'm like a you know gut person I, I look at and I'll, I think the fact that we did have public input, it wasn't something that, okay, we're just, you know, we're gonna do this. And, and like I said, the, the thousands of hours that we had had in terms of the, the committee, we had the committee members were both um, Republicans and Democrats from all parts of the state. Um, you know, but I think that that helped. Had we had just had a um, internal um, session with the committee and and just brought this this bill forward, um, it may not have that same output. But we know it was too important, and we knew the I knew what was happening nationally. We also knew what was happening locally, and so and we just which four and, and folks did see it. Not everybody liked it, but that, that numbers were were smaller. And if you, you know, explain to them, I think that helped um, to uh, resolve some of their concerns regarding the bill. I think um, your point about the internal and the external strategy is really important. I think one of the things that we really try to deploy and focus on in the Urban League movement is recognizing our power uh, and recognizing our reach with 90 affiliates across the country um, in both rural, suburban, and urban communities, our reach is broad. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about the external piece. What did you and your colleagues do to really educate the public on these issues and really um, galvanize public support that I think helped um, push you all across the finish line? I think the main thing was just talking with them in, in the, the hearings that we had and um, the fact that it would go for hours and hours and because I said, you know, everyone needed to be heard. And, and I think that we dispel what they thought this bill was. Um, and then, you know, there were cases to prove. And what our the bill does, it also gives a lot of a leeway for civilians in turn and transparency in this police misconduct. Um, you know, because you have essentially police policing themselves. And I think when you actually explain, um, so when you say that just a title, people will say, oh, they're gonna, you know, take their rights away or some of the, you know, the, the, the wise. But the people who've been through um, having their their child or their, their husband you know, kill, uh, they also were held because there are various groups that that when you you're you are conveying what happened to you and the other person couldn't relay until they heard that this does happen, 
that made a difference as well. There was a lot of that going, going along. And I think the, the key thing is that communication and, and not having that um, the bill misrepresented or what they perceive what we were trying to do. And, you know, and the key thing is like reading the bill and, and listening to the hearings where we're, pub we're open to the public. And, you know, again, not just to the committee members. I definitely got a nugget in there on the storytelling component and really being able to tell, tell the stories of real people uh, and the tragedies that they've experienced, I think at the hands of law enforcement, just to contextualize things. Um, so what advice would you have for our leaders on this call who may be interested in pursuing similar changes where they are in their state? I would recommend that they get, um, again, that public input and not just come of it saying that, okay, we're gonna do these reforms and this is what it is. Um, and because a lot of times, again, what I was saying, perception of people, when you have had them have a input and they may be wrong in what they're thinking, but, and then if you can show them these are actually a fact, it does, it does have them come around. It's just when they, like I said, that when they they think that you're just gonna uh, do away with all police. Some people do that, <laughs> turn that an extreme. But if you, yeah, and I think that input helps, um, you know, and, and, and it's best to have this done through um, your state legislature, but also on our county level, they, the, on the county level, because that's, they have the regular, you know, police, they also did a bill, not as, as, as extensive as our bill is, but for that, their level on local government, it was appropriate there. So, but, but, but if you, if they had that input, I think you have a better buy-in than to say, okay, we're just doing this. And, and you, you will find that, um, that the, uh, the people who may be naysayer are, are, Current turns they turn around to be a, a listener and then they they tend to get on board. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, we want to open the floor up to uh, have um, any of our attendees uh, or leaders drop questions in the chat and shortly I'll turn it over to Nani so that she can really moderate that part of the conversation. Um, but I think uh, we are just so happy to have you with us today. And not only have you been a leader on this issue, um, but just your, your history, uh, your bio, you have really um, taken on a leadership um, role within the legislature overall. And I think we're at a time in our country where there is a desire for more diverse voices and to be at the helm and leading our legislatures and leading our um, city councils and le leading our states and our cities. Um, I, I would love, um, since we have you here, just for you to share any anecdotal information about your journey um, and your focus on this work, um, because we know it's not always an easy job. It's definitely not an easy job to be the first um, and we know how important it is to keep the door open so that you're not the last. Yes. So Speaker yes. Jones, please feel free to share sure. any thoughts you okay. have. All right, as the 107th speaker in, in the Maryland House of Delegates, we're in the oldest state house in the country still in existence. The 106 white men before me, this would not be on their radar screen. So I look at, I took it as it is, it's not you who, if not now, when? And then if you, uh, it, and if you do it in the way you 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 be inclusive, because I have you know we have committees that certain things go through, but um, you find that people, in if they've been thinking one way all their lives, and you can turn them around by just pointing out how they're thinking. Not saying that the is, is faulty and inaccurate, but it is, but you say it in a diplomatic way. But um, but I had the opportunity in my role to have 
uh, more diversity in our house leadership positions. Um, and it wasn't because, you know, just putting someone in there because they're a person of color, because they're the best person for the job who just happened to be in a person of color. And, you know, and then get opportunities for, um, for our, our members, be more open in terms of, of what we are doing in terms of the public, even during this COVID time, we, you know, we still had our, like everybody had our Zoom meetings, people still had a way of getting in to us. Um, I'm only the third um, African-American woman speaker in the country. Um, and I think the, the one you mentioned, a, the very first one, uh, Karen, uh, Congresswoman Karen Bass, she was the first. So, um, and there are many more, there are um, a whole lot more um, black male speakers, but for women, I'm only the third, you know, so, but I think that if you love public service and you're engaged in the, in the public, uh, you're not afraid of um, taking a stand. You shouldn't be afraid to take a stand if it's the right thing to do. And, and that's why we have done, you know, we made some <laughs> major changes that would never have been done. And, and then we tried to, I did a, um, uh, racial and economic, um, ec racial equity, economic agenda, um, and trying to get more, more for on corporate boards and get them in terms of how to all these areas that hasn't really been touched. And, and it's all these things come out, you know, because it's needed. And, and I think that, I, you know, I, I'm, it may sound corny, I love public service and I, and I love, Helping, I don't like when people are not treated well or anything else. So, um, so it's in in this position it allows you to be able to to do that. Also, get input from other people who may have another way of thinking. And so, um, you know, I, I love the position and um, I love all the work that that uh, we were doing as well. Has always has been doing, and um, you know, we just need others um, soldiers to take up the. Uh, you know, the mantle and um, be throughout. I think we're going to have more increase in this in these areas across the state. But uh, anyone who wants some more detail, because we got a whole lot of information in terms of what we were changing in terms of this police reform that may be applicable to their state, I'd be more than happy to uh, share it um, with you. Well, thank you. Speaker Jones, the Urban League definitely has soldiers in this work and this movement, and we really look forward to partnering with you and our other colleagues across this country. So Nani, I think we have a question in the chat. Uh, do you want to take over? Yep. Yep, thanks, Jerrica. Um, and thank you so much, Speaker Jones. Uh, what really spoke to me about what you just said was even the name of this bill, the Police Bill of Rights Law, it makes it so hard to think about, you know, combating it. And I wish we could rename it, but it's a little, a little late. Um, I'll go over to the chat. We have a message from our wonderful CEO of Louisiana, um, from Judy Moss. Is there a Black caucus in Maryland? And if so, what role did the Black caucus play in the process? So I think this is a great question for you, Speaker Jones, and you're the only one who can answer it. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. We do have a, we have one of the largest legislative black caucus in the country. And a lot of their members are, are, um, are committee chairs. They were involved in the, on, on the um, board that I had, I had put together when we started doing this, this um, hearings on, on dealing with this police reform bill. Um, you know, we have both in the Senate and the House and um, we have a very strong um, caucus. And um, you know, like I said, they're, they're involved in all areas um, uh, to make this House and Senate run. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another question. Um, this is from our EJSI intern, Naomi. Naomi asked, uh, this is also for you, Speaker Jones, did you receive pushback from police supporters and unions? And if so, how did you respond to this pushback? 
Um, some, somewhat, but we also had them to come testify at the hearing. Um, those who got uh, pushed back because they didn't want the the change in the law law enforcement officer bill of rights, um, and you know, and that that sort of uh, took them off. And but but we also had some other law enforcement um, individuals that you know, that saw that some of the things were going on within their particular precinct that it was necessary. So it sort of counterbalance each, each other. Uh, not everybody's gonna agree on everything, but if you only have uh, one focus and not looking at the broader picture or actually read the bill, um, you will get misinformation. And, and if you, you try to sh share on that misinformation, it doesn't do good in terms of getting up the truth and what the whole purpose of the bill was. Thank you so. Thank you so much for that answer, Speaker Jones. And we have a couple more questions in the chat, but I really want to respect everybody's time for joining us today. And we're coming up to four o'clock. So um, I'm going to turn things over to Derricka Richardson for our closing. Um, but before I turn things over to her, I just want to let everybody on this call know that we have developed uh, one to two page documents for each state with these laws, and we will be sending them to everybody who registered for this call after this meeting, um, most likely tomorrow. So you'll be able to see the law in your state and to get a sense of if the law has one of these problematic provisions that we've already listed, and also you'll have a chance to see the history of the law. So if you want to consider you know, combating it, revising it, repealing it, you have some of the information to get you started. And now I'll turn things over to Jerrica for closing. Thanks, Donnie. You took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> but I just want to say thank you very much to Speaker Jones and Attorney Burnett and all of our colleagues uh, and the EJSI team uh, for joining us today. Um, we really had, uh, I think, a fruitful discussion and about an often overlooked bar barrier um, to meaningful police accountability. We know there's many of them, um, but really seeing the work of Speaker Jones and her colleagues and how they were able to get this done in Maryland inspires us. And I hope it inspires you in this movement and, and really just reiterates how important it is for us to turn our protest into policy and how we have to really harness um, this power that we have gained over the years and make sure that it turns into meaningful reform for our community. And it's quite clear that we're in, in, at an inflection point with 85% of Americans agreeing that the United States needs to change its system of policing. Um, so with that, I'll just remind you all that the time for action is now. Um, and just know that the Equitable Justice and Strategic Initiatives team is really here to support you. We are happy to be a resource for you. Um, we will definitely share more information about the toolkit. Um, and you know, Nani has already shared uh, the information um, about the primers on the, the various states that have these laws in the chat. Uh, but please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, or uh, email us at equitablejustice at nul.org. Um, it's our job to support you and support the work that you're doing in your communities. Um, and we just thank you for your time today and look forward to continuing to work, for, to work with you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.